have your Bibles with you, please turn to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. We're just going to read a few scriptures, and, uh, and this is going to be, I'm really excited about this message, because I believe it, it's going to talk to every single one of us in this room of what it really requires to live a successful life. Live a successful life. And Genesis chapter 12, starting at verse 1. Is, there, is somebody there? Say amen. amen. And if you're not, don't worry about it. It's on the screen, y'all. Come on, somebody. So at the end of the day, here we go. This is what God's word says. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Wow, what a powerful, powerful blessing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. So right now, Lord, we prepare our hearts and our minds to receive all that you have for us. And Lord, speak to us individually right where we are. Meet us on this journey, Lord Father, and we just thank you, Lord God, that you're a God that is faithful, you're dependable, you're reliable, and Father God, we thank you that we can count on you, Lord God, and we know that your word always goes out and it accomplishes what it needs to accomplish, that it will never return void. So Father, we just thank you for that assurance, and we praise you in Jesus' name, and all the children of God will shout, Oh, I had to get you to shout just one moment because I know sometimes on a Wednesday, we've had a long day, y'all, and some of us just need to shout just a little bit to get stirred up. Amen? Listen, for many of us, when we hear the word process or the word success, the first thing we think about is a big house, a nice car, and a whole lot of money. Amen? But today, I, I want to share something with you. Today, to have real success in Christ, trust is a must. Everybody say that. Trust is a must. It's about trusting God for all the things that God provides for us. See, those, some of those things may come as a result. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a nice house. Come on, somebody. There's nothing, nothing wrong with driving a nice vehicle. Listen, there's nothing wrong with having a whole lot of money. Come on, somebody. The last time I read my Bible, I, when you read about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you find out that they were very successful. They had lots of, lots of animals, right? Lots of uh, sheep and, and donkeys, and, and they had servants. And I mean, when they traveled, they had a big, I mean, a whole bunch of people traveling together. So it shows me that God is okay with you being prosperous. Come on, somebody. God is okay with you being successful. Like he said earlier, it's not money, but the love of money, right, which is the root of all evil. But I always say that if you have a lot of money, come on, somebody, all money does is amplify who you are. So if you're a really good person and you have a lot of money, guess what you become? a greater person that can give stuff away and bless a lot of people. Now, if you have a lot of money and you're a jerk, then guess what? You become a bigger jerk because now you think that the whole world owes you something or you think you're more than anyone else because you put your trust in your checking account and you don't put your trust in God. See, I believe that being a loving, caring husband or wife is success. See, I believe that raising children that fear God is success. See, I believe that being an honest, hardworking person is success. You see, I believe that success is not about what we do, but who we are. Success is about our character. Success is about our spirituality. Listen, I'm not so worried about your giftedness. I'm more concerned about your godliness. And see, when you walk in, see, I know a lot of folks who are super gifted, but man, they are a challenge. I know folks that may not be quite as gifted, but they're godly. I'd rather have a godly person, come on, somebody, somebody who's serving the Lord and doing great and mighty things than someone who's got all the gifts and they're just full of themselves. Come on, somebody. Sometimes there's no room for God in people's lives like that because they're so full of them that there's no place for him. 
you know, success is really a sum of c- consistent, repeated, small efforts. When you do the right thing and you do it over and over again and you, and you take one step at a time, you'll find out that success really is that. As a matter of fact, let me just say this. What success really is, is having and doing the right things on this planet to fulfill your assignment that God has given you. See, that's really success. At the end of the day, success is all about making sure that God's will is being accomplished in your life, no matter what that looks like. So it may include a lot of uh, possessions and things like that, but it may not include any of that. It may just include being a person who sells himself out for the Lord and becomes a mouthpiece for God, a person who knows how to pray and bring down God's power, amen, and God's anointing. You see, that's success in the kingdom. That is currency in the kingdom of God as well. You see, success is a journey. It's not a destination. See, success is a process. It's not a place. Success is about, is about constantly overcoming opposition. Anyone who's been really successful has had a lot to fight for. Come on, somebody. Anyone who's had any type of success in this world understands what opposition looks like. But this is what I say. Opposition is a sign of progress. See, when you're doing something good and you're moving in the right direction and God is using you, listen, just know that opposition is coming because everything God does is surrounded by warfare. Oh, come on, somebody. Somebody's got to say amen. Somebody who knows what it is to go forward and have opposition and fighting and the enemy opposes you and people around you oppose you. Listen, even the people in the church will oppose you when God is doing something great and mighty because how many know the devil goes to church too? Oh, come on, somebody. As a matter of fact, he attends more regularly than some of us. Come on, somebody. I'm just keeping it real today. And we have to understand that because the enemy is everywhere, we have to be careful when it comes to God's promises and what God is doing for every single one of us. See, tonight, our biblical narrative is found in the book of Genesis chapter 12. And you see, Webster defines the word Genesis as the origin or the beginning of something. So you see, when you read the book of Genesis in chapter 1, we see the beginning of all creation, and God begins with Adam. In Genesis chapter 7, we see the ark as God cleans the slate and begins again with Noah. In Genesis chapter 11, we see the Tower of Babel. And how God confuses uh, mankind with different languages. And now he he begins again with Abram. You see, every time God hit the reset button, come on somebody. And he did several times in the book of Genesis. He always began again with another person who was surrendered to him. Because he found people that understood that trust is a must. Come on somebody. That was one of the main qualifications. If you want it to be used of God, even today, if you want to be used of God in a greater way, then you have to learn how to trust him. Because how many know that we don't always understand what God is doing? So I don't know about you. Now, his word says that his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So that means that he doesn't kind of, he doesn't kind of, he's not here on on the same plane and the same level that we are. He is way above what we see or think. And, that, and of course, that means he has a bigger picture. Everybody say bigger picture. bigger picture. He has a bigger picture because he's zoomed way out. And he sees everything that, is, of course, is connected to everything. So we might just see what we see, but God sees everything going on around us as well. See, we might see, we might see straight ahead. But God sees around the corners. Come on, somebody. God sees the things that we don't see. That's why God might change your direction. And you say, man, I mean, God, why are you doing this? This seems to be the right way to go. And God says, yeah, as you're going straight right around that next corner, you have no idea what's getting ready to happen. Oh, come on, somebody. And God loves us so much that he's able to direct us and redirect us when we start going in certain directions. Now, in in our passage of Scripture... His name, his name here is Abram, which Abram means exalted father. So when, you read the, when you're reading this scripture, they don't call him Abraham. They call him Abram 
Now, later on, he goes from being an exalted father to Abraham, which means the father of many. Come on, somebody. The father of nations. You see, God begins, changes his, his name because he changes his assignment. He broadens and extends what Abraham is supposed to do. Now, some of us may be new in the faith here today and have recently decided to follow Christ. I want to commend you if that's you. Some of us have been born again for a while, and we, but we need to be reminded. Everybody say reminded. reminded. Turn to the person next to you and say, person, person. remind me. Remind me. I need to be reminded because it's so easy to forget sometimes when we've been in the Lord. See, to be reminded of what it takes to continue to trust God and live a fruitful Christian life. See, some of us tonight may have not have made that commitment to Christ at all. Maybe you're sitting here just kind of kicking the tires, kind of checking this Christian thing out. See, a lot of folks come to church, and of course, it's a great activity. It's a positive place to be, but that doesn't always mean that they've come to a place of surrender, but they come to a place where they commit their lives to Christ, and if that's you, I'm glad you're here. I'm really glad you're here because I believe God's got a word. No matter where you are in these three places, no matter where you are spiritually tonight, we can look at Abraham's example and see how he reveals three keys, three keys to build trust and live a successful life. Now, if you've got your papers in front of you that look like this, go ahead and pull it out right now because you're going to start filling out the blanks. Now, you know why I give these papers out so you can fill out the blanks? So y'all can stay awake. Come on, somebody. I ain't no dummy. Come on. I got to put you to work so you can stay engaged. So at the end of the day, the first, you know, the things that, that, that we talk about and the first, very first key that we see in God's word is this. Abraham abandons selfish pride. He abandons selfish pride. You see, in Genesis 12, 1, it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your, fa and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. Now, if Abraham was to become a powerful man of God, which he was called to do, if he was to become the father of great nations, if he wanted to fulfill God's plan, if he wanted to move with God, he would have to abandon selfish pride. See, here are the three areas that he had to abandon before he could move on with the Lord. The first one is this. He had to abandon his reputation. Fill that out. He had to abandon in his reputation. You see, in the first part of Genesis 1, of verse 1, it says, and Lord said to Abram, leave your native country. See, Abraham was 75 years old, and he had a good reputation in his community, but he had to leave that behind to proceed with God. You see, he was very well respected where he was. He, not only was he from a, a good family, but he also had built up his name as well as a very reputable person. You see, sometimes we have a hard time serving God because we have a reputation that we're trying to maintain, a status that we're trying to sustain, and hallelujah, a position that we're trying to preserve. See, so often we don't serve God the way we need to because we're so busy worrying about what people think about us. They don't want, you don't want people to think that you're one of those Jesus freaks. Come on, somebody. They don't want you to know that you go to church, come on, Wednesday night and Sunday and, and every time the doors open that, that you attend men's groups, that the women go to women's groups and you go to prayer gatherings and, and you're on Zoom in the morning at 7 a.m. with Pastor Carlos in the walking in the spirit. Come on, somebody. So you start doing stuff like that, people just think you're just a little bit over the top. But you know what? Jesus was probably the best example of someone who really didn't care. It didn't matter what other people thought about him. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 7, God's word says this. Let this mind which be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, he goes seven, but made himself of what? No reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. So you see, Jesus did not care about his reputation. 
He knew that he had to come and be an example for every one of us, and he wasn't trying to impress man. He was here to impress God. Come on, somebody. To impress his heavenly father. The second thing that we see that he had to abandon, fill in the blanks, is abandon his relationships. Oh, come on, somebody. He had to abandon relationships. In Genesis 1, again, it says, leave your relatives and your father's family. Now, if Abraham wanted to walk in the fullness of God's blessing, he needed to leave the security and the safety of his family, come on, and totally depend on God. Not only that, but when you read about the area that he came from, the Chaldeans of the earth, they were actually very much uh, idol worshipers. See, it was very much of a, uh, that particular culture. So God says, I got to get you out of this culture. I don't care if it's your mama, your daddy, or anybody else. Come on, somebody. I got to pull you out of this culture because I'm going to do something so big and so mighty, and I have to be the one you depend on. And you see, he had to abandon relationships. See, we should never allow our relationship with God to be affected by family ties, by relationships with other people. You know, and of course, we need to understand that certain relationships just got to go. Because listen, where you're going... Not everyone can go. Come on, somebody. See, God's going to take you to places that he's only going to take you there. And sometimes folks will be with you for a season. But after that, man, it's time to move on, right? And God will bring other relationships that will edify you as you move on as well. But the relationships that we keep have to be godly. In 2 Corinthians 6.14, it says this. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? We have to be so careful. Listen, not everyone can go where God's taking you. See, some of the most poisonous people we know come disguised as family. Come on, somebody. They just do. I'm just telling you. They just come disguised as as family. And I believe that God gives us crazy family sometimes. Come on, somebody. To teach us what unconditional love needs to look like. Oh, come on. Because you can choose your friends, right? You can pick your friends. You can pick your nose. No, wait a minute. I say that. But you can't pick your family. Their family is there, hey, through good, bad, or ugly. Come on, somebody. At the end of the day, God gives us a family that we have to love on, and I believe that's part of God's plan as well. But we need to know, listen, the higher you go, the smaller your circle gets. See, the smaller your circle gets, because not everyone can operate at that altitude. See, not every week can. So you be very, very cautious about the relationships that you keep in your life. And, of course, the third thing is this. Abandon reason. Oh, here we go. Abandon reason. In Genesis 1, uh, the, the, the last part of that verse, it says, and go to the land that I will show you. Now, so not only does... Not only does he have to leave his country, his friends and family, but he is going to a land that he hasn't even seen yet. You think the people in his family and his friends, when he said, I'm packing up my bags and I'm going, and they said, well, where are you going? He said, I don't know. I'm just going. I believe they thought he was off his rocker. Come on, somebody. They said, man, homie has lost his mind. How is he going to pack up? I mean, he's successful. He's got a good name. He's got, I mean, he's got a nice crib. Come on, he's got a nice house. You know, I mean, he's got everything he needs. He's got all this stuff, and he's just packing up and going somewhere that he doesn't even know exists. See, he abandoned reasons because sometimes God will do stuff that, listen, at the end of the day, it doesn't make sense. Sometimes he'll do things that like, like, why would you quit that job to go into the ministry? Come on, somebody. Like, why would you let go of this to take hold of this? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it's not reasonable. But how many know that wherever God moves you to is the right place to be? See, wherever God moves you is always going to be the right place to be because why? Because we have to trust that God is in control. We have to trust that the Lord sees what's in our future and he knows what we need. And you know why? Because trust is a must. If you want to go forward in the Lord, then you have to trust him 
even when it seems unreasonable, even when everyone around you says, man, you are out of your mind, you go forward anyway, because if God said it, he's going to do it. Oh, come on. I want to just praise the Lord right there. If you've heard a word from the Lord, listen, a lot of us have heard words from God, and we shared it with people, and they said, you're out of your mind. You know why? You have to be careful about relationships as well, because you can't share your dreams with everybody. Oh, come on. You can't share what God wants to do in your life with just everybody, because at the end of the day, we got people. Listen, you have people in your life that you're trying to impress, and they secretly want you to Mm, come on, somebody. There are people that you, are, you, you want to impress them, and every time you do something good, you come and they say, oh, man, that's really, really nice. But at the end of the day, they might be with you, but they're not for you. So we have to use wisdom to understand what those relationships look like and to make sure that we stay up and be with, within reason, right? I love this. The Bible in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we walk by faith and not by you see, he didn't see where he was going, but he knew where he was going. Come on, somebody. He knew that God was going to lead him, and that was enough. See, some of us end up in places that we were, we're like, how do we get here? And listen, God got you there. And the way he did it may not be always conventional, but he always, his purposes are always fulfilled as well. You see, Martin Luther King said this, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. Amen. Mm. See, man says this, show me and I'll trust you. God says, trust me and I'll show you. You see, we need to understand that God always wants us to take the first step. See, Peter had to take the first step out of the boat before he realized that he was walking on water. Come on, somebody. Listen, I believe we have some water walkers in this room. I believe some of us trust the Lord, and some of us, when God says, go, you'll say, send me. See, and I believe when you get to that place, God is going to put you in places. He's going to use you in ways you can never imagine, because that's the God that we serve. He's just looking. Listen, he's not worried about your ability. He wants your availability. And when you make yourself available, listen, you ain't got to be the best at what you do. You don't have to be, have the most gifts and the most talent. You just got to trust because trust is a must. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. And you see, I believe that Abraham abandoned his reputation. He abandoned his relationships. He abandoned his reasoning. So why? Why was Abraham willing to risk everything and go on this journey? See, what inspired and motivated Abraham to take some, such an outrageous step of faith? That brings me to point number two. Key number two is this. Believe in specific promises. Believe in God's specific promises. See, God spoke to him specifically. It wasn't a general word. See, in Genesis 12, uh, verse 2 and 3, it says this. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How many know that's a pretty specific uh, a promise, and Abraham embraced it? He realized that he was born for more than where he was. You see, he might have been at home comfortable in the, in the Chaldeans with the, with, that, with the group there, with his family and friends. He was comfortable, but he realized that there was more to this. He realized that he was a son of destiny. So when he rolled out, when he got that promise from God, it was easy for him to obey because he realized that he was more than where he was. Listen, some of you in this room know what I'm talking about. Some of you are so uncomfortable in your lives right now, not because things are bad. As a matter of fact, things might be going actually really, really well. And the hardest thing to do and to obey God is, is when things are going good, he wants something greater. And sometimes God will take you out of the good place to move you to a greater place. The only problem is that there's a process. Everybody say process. Man, there's a process to get you from where you are to God, where God wants you to be. Because the next mountaintop is higher than the mountaintop you're on. But before you get to that mountaintop, 
You have to revisit the valley. Come on, somebody. You have to revisit that place that may be challenging. It may be tough because God's going to elevate you. God wants to promote you. God wants to move you forward. But most of the time before he, he, he takes you to that place, he's going to test you. Come on, somebody. See, faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. So every time God wants to trust you with more, he's going to test you to make sure you have what it takes, not just to get there, but to stay there, to maintain it, to sustain the promotion and, the, and where God is moving you forward, you see? So God has all these things. See, we need to have faith and believe God's word. When you start believing God's word, you start realizing that God has all these great things, and we need to trust that God wants to speak to us. You know, I have a T-shirt. I should have worn it today. <laughs> it says, how can you say God is silent when your Bible is closed? Oh, come on, somebody. That's a drop mic right there. Come on now. At the end of the day, I hear people, a Christian say, man, I mean, I don't ever hear from God. What? Oh, every day, open that Bible. God will speak to you. Listen, God will speak to you as often as you want to be spoken to. See, some of us don't want to hear what God has to say. <laughs> some of us don't want to hear it because we know that when he speaks truth, we're going to have to change somewhat. Come on, somebody. People, when he begins to speak truth, the Bible says the truth will make you free. free. That means if you're free, that means you were bound before. Come on, somebody. The, you were bound, and now God's going to set you free. And some of us just like being bound. Can I just keep it real for a moment? How many, listen, can I say this? How many know that sin is fun for a season? Oh, come on, somebody. You don't have to be all religious, okay? Nobody wants to raise their hand. Oh, the pastor just say sin was fun. Come on, man. Let's keep it real. We had a good time in our sinful life, right? We did. We were doing all this stuff until we realized, come on, somebody, until God became real and you realized that that sin, come on, was going to take you straight to hell. Can I just get an amen on that? Amen. I'm just keeping it real, right? And all of a sudden, it becomes real to you. And then you say, man, I was having a whole lot of fun. But all of a sudden, that thing turns on you. It turns on you really hard because the devil sets you up. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't get set up. Don't get set up because the devil entice you to do something and then get you busted. Come on, somebody. I mean, he'll, he'll bring a temptation into your life, right? And then you, you, you buy down to that. And then all of a sudden, the consequences and all this stuff just starts blowing up around you because you got set up. That's what the devil does. He makes everything look fine. It looks good. It looks sweet. But man, at the end of the day, boy, it can wreck your life. Amen? See, many of us have been a wreck. So now we need a checkup from the neck up. Come on, somebody. Oh, come on, somebody. At the, at the end of the day, we realize that we have to get our head in the right place. You know, when, you, when you're born, you know, you don't come out feet first. Come on, somebody. You come out head first. Oh, some of y'all are going to get this in a second because you need to realize that if you're bound up in something, your mind has to come out before the rest of you does. Come on, somebody. The way you think has to change as well. And you see, God is doing something great in Abraham's life. He promised to make him a great nation. The Lord brought him out. He separated him and performed a miracle, right? Even his barren wife had a child. Isaac was born, and the Hebrew nation was miraculously begun. See, God also promised that Abraham's name would be great. Do you realize that the name of Abraham is reverenced among the Muslims? amongst the Arabs, amongst the Jews, and amongst the Christians. He made all the books. Come on, somebody. Come on. He's in the Quran. Come on. He's in, all the, he's, a, he's in our book, the Bible. He's in all the books. His name is great upon, amongst all the people. So begin to understand this. This is a, a promise that God fulfilled in such a great and mighty way. And you see, God has magnified his name. And I believe this, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, and God's promises are him, are yes, come on, somebody, yes, and amen, and in him, amen, to the glory of God. Listen, understand that when God makes a promise, he's going to do it. He makes a promise, he's going to perform it. So what do you need right now? What do you need that requires God's intervention? See, when God made that promise to, to Abraham, you got to remember, he was feeling out of place and out of sorts. He knew there was more. There was a need in his life. So when he called him out, 
say, I'm going to make you a great nation. He said, man, that's exactly what I needed. I need to get out of here. I, need, I know there's more in my life. Listen, what are the needs you're having in your life right now? Where are, the, where are you in this place in your spiritual walk? What specific promises are you believing God for? Do you have any? Have you gone through the word of God and pulled out the promises and said, this is the promise. Listen, if you have unsaved loved ones, go to the book of Acts and it says, when you're saved, so shall your household. And stand upon that promise and believe that God, listen, are you broke, busted, and disgusted? Come on, somebody. Are you having more month than, are you having more month than you have finances? Listen, stand on God's promises. He said, I will supply all your needs according to my riches and glory through Christ Jesus. You see, God's got promises for every area of our lives, and we need to start being specific and using those promises as well. And the last thing is this. The third key is this, commitment to spiritual progress. Commitment to spiritual progress. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, it says this, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. Abraham departed. In other words, he moved on. In other words, he took action. In other words, he progressed. When God said jump, he said how high. When God said move, he said here I come. See, at the end of the day, we can sur- you can surrender your life totally to God and stand on all his promises. But if you haven't committed your life to spiritual progress, at the end of the day, we need to continue to pour into our faith and continue to grow. See, we need a determination to stay plugged in to the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, come on, somebody. Listen, it's not just coming to Christ. It's staying in Christ and walking in the power, progressing in where God wants you to go. God is always moving. The word of God says he's always doing a new thing. See, he's always doing something new, so we need to stay progressive, our ears open, our eyes open to see where God wants to move us as well. You see, so how is the spirit of God going to reveal this commitment to us? How does God reveal that to us? How do we know, right? Here are three things. Now, these, these, these three things are quick, and then I'm going to pray. Here's three ways that God reveals what he's doing in our lives so that we can trust him more. Why do we need to trust him? Because trust is a must. It is a requirement. God wants you to trust him, amen? And this is, these are the three things. You want to jot these down quickly. The first one is this. Because of his word, you need to comply to the word of God. Just write that down. Comply to the word of God. See, you can't have a commitment to spiritual progress unless you build an altar in your life where, where of course, you can move on. See, spiritual maturity isn't measured in how high you jump in praise but how straight you walk in obedience. The second thing is this, confess the word of God. Learn to confess it. Learn to speak it. You see, in this particular case, if you kept reading, you saw that Abraham built an altar unto the Lord. And when you build an altar, it speaks of worship. But he did it openly. It was a confession of his faith when he built that altar. He's saying, listen, I'm confessing that I serve the true and living God. And the last thing is this, continue in the word of God. See, you want to comply to it. You want to, con- you want to confess the word of God, but you want to continue. How many know that this is not a sprint? How many know that this is a marathon? Amen. This is not something you just come and you just have a, a, an encounter with the Lord and, man, I'm good. Folks teach that in some places. You get saved when you were seven. I guess you're going to heaven no matter how you live your life. I'm not sure if I agree with that. I believe that because it's a journey and because you're moving on, you have to continue serving the Lord. Because Jesus said, those that are preserved to the end. See, so I believe that we continue to move and we continue to work our salvation. Now, you can, listen, if you're saved, people should see it. Come on, somebody. It should be apparent. It should be something obvious. While everybody else is getting shaken up, you're walking in peace. While everybody else is losing their mind, Man, your mind is set on Christ. While everyone else is, is going through all the challenges and all the stress of this world, you say, man, I don't put my trust in this world. I have my trust in the Lord. And I know what his word says. Listen, I read the back of the book. Amen. Come on, somebody. When we read the back of the book, you find out that we are 
more than conquerors. You find out that we are victorious. Come on. You find out that he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. You find out that when you when he shows up, come on, that those that are in Christ, those that are, are, are gone will rise up first and the rest of us go up with them. Come on, somebody. When I read the word of God, I know that I know that I know that there's going to be two judgments. The first judgment, guess what? When you're in Christ, you don't have to attend that one. You get to bypass the first judgment. Come on, somebody. Those that don't know the Lord, that's the judgment they have to attend. And that's not a good one. That's what the, that's what the book of Revelation says. The second judgment, however, is our works. The things that we've done for God. You see, all the stuff that we do in this world, I mean, it really doesn't mount up to much unless we're doing them for the Lord. Now, don't get me wrong. Everything we do becomes a ministry if you really look at it well. Even your job is a ministry because God puts you in this place not just to be employed, but to be deployed. See, God has you as one of his agents in the middle of that godless place. Come on, somebody where everybody is cussing and talking crazy, but God has you right in the middle of that because you're the light in the midst of all that darkness. It's your mission field. It's where you get to shine for Jesus. So I want to encourage you today. Trust is a must. And when you comply to God's word and you, and you continue in his word and you confess his word, then that builds the trust on the inside, the trust that says, I don't understand it. I'm not going to lean on my, uh, my own understanding, right? Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all ways. Come on. Acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Proverbs 3, Proverbs 5, 3 and 5, right? It's true. So today, I don't know where you are spiritually, but I hope that throughout your spiritual walk, you'll come to a place where you start trusting God. Because, listen, if you're worrying about everything, if you're worrying about some things, the things that you worry about are the things you haven't trusted God with. Mm, come on, somebody. I'm just keeping it real today. Just bow your heads for a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you tonight, Lord God, because you're a good God. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that we'll continue. For those that are here, we'll just continue to put their trust in you. To know, oh God, that you are trustworthy that you are faithful, that you're dependable, that you're reliable, that we, don't have, and we shouldn't have any doubt because every promise you've ever made to us, you fulfilled. Everything you say in your word is coming to pass. And even if it hasn't come to pass yet, it's in the process of happening. So, Lord, I just thank you for my brothers and sisters here tonight that will trust you and put all their hope in you. Hallelujah. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. We can trust that that which you've begun, you'll be faithful to complete. And we just thank you. Everybody just stand to their feet really quick here.